Добро пожаловать! Welcome to Binkov's HQ. Imagine a world where Canada is on its own, where US wouldn't lift a finger to protect it. Imagine a really angry Russia, hell-bent on invading their northern neighbor. Russian army is considerably bigger. Look at all these ships and planes. But invading a long way from home requires strong logistics. And all this ice doesn't help. So, could the Russian military might pull it off? It's time to put that high-tech talk into the high gear, as Russia tries to invade Canada. Yeah, Russia is a bigger country. It has more people, its GDP adjusted for purchasing power is bigger. And on top of that, Russia spends a lot more on defense. Or offense in this hypothetical instance. The figures are again adjusted for purchasing power. So where is even the contest, you ask? Here it is. Canada is quite far away. And the shortest route is actually not necessarily the best. Going over the ice cap is a bad idea. Ships can't really go through such ice. Sure, Russia has some nuclear-powered icebreakers, but still, breaking ice is slow, and ships would need to travel in convoys protected from newly formed ice by even more icebreakers. The enemy would have it easier to locate and threaten such convoys. What about going over the ice itself? Sure, in theory it's doable. But wheeled vehicles would have a very hard time finding traction, which means most of logistical train would need to use tracked vehicles, basically precluding the effective use of majority of Russian army. Also, the climate would be harsh, and crossing a few thousand miles without infrastructure would mean frequent breakdowns, deaths due to exposure and massive issues in food and fuel supply. On top of that, Canada could use bombs, mines and torpedoes to break the ice. So the incursions over the ice would be limited to small commando units dropped off near the Canadian shores. A proper invasion would necessarily have to involve forces brought in by ships, so first the Canadian Navy and Air Force would need to be neutralized. That Canadian Navy is but a token force when compared to the Russian might. Russian nuclear submarines would be of greatest importance, due to their nearly unlimited autonomy. But even the surface fleet difference is considerable. While Russian fleet is on the average less advanced, sheer numbers are still hard to argue against. Of course, all these ships can't be expected to just sail around the polar ice cap and remain on station for months. Only part of that fleet could be sustained near Canada. Russia does have a decent underway replenishment fleet, allowing part of the combat fleet to operate without bases. Furthermore, Russian bases at Murmansk and Kamchatka do mean Canadian western and eastern shores aren't that far away. Most Russian ships shown carry food enough for 30 days, with smaller ones enough for two weeks. Most of them would need some refueling when they approach Canada, which would require almost all of the tanker capacity. Yet combat ships would need to go home themselves after several months, for maintenance. Russia is thus unlikely to keep more than a half of those ships near Canadian shores at any one time. At the same time, Canada would have another problem combining its eastern and western fleet. Canadian Northern Arctic route would be closed by ice most of the time and would be too risky, and going through Panama Canal would take too long. Russia would thus choose where and when to attack, but their surface fleet has poor area air defenses, which haven't really been modernized properly, and their sole carrier doesn't carry many planes. Also, if without air cover, even Russian nuclear subs would occasionally get hunted down. On the other hand, Canadian F-18s do not use any anti-ship missiles and at best might resort to use Maverick missiles or laser-guided bombs. In theory, Canadian F-18s could be integrated with Harpoon missiles, but in order for that to be done quickly, help from US government would be needed, which goes beyond the rules of this scenario. But at least Canadian Hornets could defend the airspace. Their AMRAMs are quite capable and their numbers eclipse the Russian carrier's planes. Trouble is, Russia has ground-based planes to use as well. But again, things aren't so simple, as Canada is far, far away. Russia did recently start to rebuild its old Arctic air bases. But even with those, getting planes across to Canada would be extremely hard. Here's a nominal list of Russian tactical planes. Combat radius is a highly flexible category. Here it's given for usual warloads, flying high and slow, which may not be plausible when around enemy. Clearly, without in-air refueling, none of those planes could reach Canada. But not all Russian planes can be refueled in air. Russian air tanker fleet isn't very big though. 
and their fuel transfer capacity at long ranges isn't that great. What all that means is that the combat radii of the planes shown could be doubled for only some of them. There'd be less than 400 tons of fuel available per day, assuming one sortie a day. Refueling MiG-29s or 31s would be a waste as they're not as efficient as flanker family types. So it's unlikely Russia would reach 70 tactical fighter jets over Lower Canada, with carrier jets accounted for. In a way, Canadian fleet might not be outnumbered initially. Their retired Hornet fleet is however unlikely to return to service, as their airframe lives have been spent. They would need a lengthy refurbishment process, which Canada might not have time for. So, trying to land forces on Canadian eastern and western shores without air superiority might end in a disaster for Russia. Russian amphibious assault fleet isn't huge, and getting troops over very long distances takes time. A ship would need roughly two weeks to again reach the Canadian northern shores after its first landing. Russians could thus count on perhaps 6,000 marines with vehicles initially, with those numbers growing slowly every two weeks. Russian airborne units would, of course, add more. Illusion 76 flying from Murmansk to Labrador and back could paradrop some 12 tons of payload, which isn't very efficient. But the same plane going from Russian far northeast and dropping troops to northern coast of Yukon territory could do so with full payload. If 75% of Russian transport fleet becomes available for such a mission, Russia could drop up to 23,000 paratroopers in one go. Though realistically, less planes would likely be available and units deploy with their vehicles and other assets, greatly lowering actual troop counts. Nevertheless, airborne drops would definitely be Russian weapon of choice but they wouldn't go anywhere near Canadian forces. Instead, they would drop troops way up north. Their goal would be to try and establish bases far away from the reach of Canadian forces. Bases where, ideally, Russia could land transport planes on and even operate fighters from. Building such bases can be quick if terrain and climate is right, but in such harsh environment the work might take months depending on Canadian Air Force harassment. Also, larger bases might take even more time. Canada does have air tankers of their own, enabling their F-18s to strike construction sites, but that would lead to some casualties. Even if they delay the construction by a month, Canada would eventually get low on planes. On the other hand, Russia could afford to lose 50 planes in such battles and still soldier on. Canada might try to stop such incursions with ground troops as well, but its trained army force is fairly small. And it too would have issues getting heavy weapons to the fight up north, by helicopters. Trying to fight Russians up north would only play into the Russian hand, making it easier for Russian Air Force to participate. Canada could initially rely on its assets that are part of the NORAD early warning network. Though Russian strikes would eventually make Canada blind in those northern regions. Russian bomber fleet would unleash its cruise missiles. Russian Navy cruise missiles would also help. The medium-sized Tupolev bombers lack range and would need to be refitted before they can be refueled in air. Russian edge in recon is very significant, as Canada doesn't really have many aerial recon platforms, nor satellites. Russia could track most large Canadian formations. Another huge issue for Canadians would be their absolute lack of ground-based air defenses. Canada relies on manpad class weapons only, so any UAV at medium altitude could do its mission undisturbed. If Russia wanted a proper land invasion right away, the amphibious landing fleet might have the harder task of reaching Labrador. But that might end up being too bloody, as Canadian forces are more concentrated there, and infrastructure is better for bringing in tanks. Once a steady inflow of fresh troops is established, Russia could slowly start pressing into Canada. Terrain would be harsh though, with many lakes and forests slowing down advanced. Perfect for a small group of Canadian defenders to perform hit and raid runs. Snow-wise, Canada isn't actually completely covered throughout the year. Both sides are kind of accustomed to snow, but Russia would suffer more due to slow down movement and additional cargo needed on overseas supply lines. Canada would have little reason to try and make a front line up north. It would nibble away at incoming Russian forces. Once the Russians establish some air bases closer, what's left of the Canadian Air Force at that point would have to seize most offensive ops. By that point, it would be a matter of pure numbers. What Russia manages to transport and upkeep in northern Canada versus what little Canada can muster, which isn't a lot. 
and the second phase of stepping stone bases might be conducted. Using the already created bases for additional air support, airborne and amphibious landings might again be conducted, this time on Newfoundland in the east and Graham Island in the west. More newly trained airborne troops might be needed though. So we're talking about six months to a year from start of hostilities. And while Russians could be bringing in troops with regular cargo ships, which are much more effective, Canadians would use the time to mobilize in large numbers. That's not to say Russia couldn't mobilize as well. But lopsided losses would influence the morale and upkeeping a force far away from home with little infrastructure and in harsh conditions would be much harder. It's unlikely Russia would ever operate a million troops in Canada, even with all the mobilization. The time elapsed would also mean Canada could be receiving large shipments of various weapons, bought from the foreign companies and through various black markets. Actually landing again on Canadian southern mainland or getting mass formations from Russian northern bases down south would still incur terrible losses. The woods and the snow it would diminish the Russian hardware edge and losses would likely be higher than Canadian ones. Russia might be in for another winter war. It would take some of the opponent's lands, but at a terrible cost. And unless it desires a multi-year effort depleting its economy and taking lives of hundreds of thousands of its troops, it's likely it would eventually be content with some limited gains and end further invasion. And within one year, Russian gains would be fairly minimal, while suffering greater losses. Just a reminder, if you need to secure your online connection, ExpressVPN can help. Imagine me having to research something about the effects of a nuclear blast for some video, for example. Those who don't know what my videos are about might get some weird ideas if they snoop around. I find ExpressVPN being faster than other VPN providers I tried. It has server locations in 94 countries, lots of options. It was easy to install and is easy to use, just one click. And you can access content that would otherwise be available only in some countries, which comes really handy when you pay for US Netflix, for example, and you have a long hotel stay traveling to some other country. Check out the link on the screen or click down below in the video description. In a one-year package, you'll get three months for free. After that, it's less than $7 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.